Well, it's a real pleasure to be here and to, to receive this award from BI. Uh, the, uh, there are two things that maybe I should comment in the beginning. First, uh, uh, the year 1943 that uh, BI started was uh, also an important year for me, because uh, it was the year I was born. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the second thing is one of the areas that BI has done very important work is uh, environmental economic sustainability. And uh, that is one of the areas that I've been very uh, committed to and, and, and very engaged in, and the work of, of BI has been very important in that area. Uh, the topic that I'm uh, talking about might seem to be a, a, a very narrow and particular topic, but uh, the reason I wanted to talk about this in a, in a way is that uh, probably the most important uh, issue that economic, economics can address is how do we design our economic system? Uh, how does our whole economic and political system work together? And there are many different forms of uh, economic system. There was communism, there's capitalism. Uh, there were many variants of uh, the market economy. Uh, there's Yugoslavian uh, socialism. Uh, and uh, the one I'm going to talk about is a very much sui generis, which is China's economic system, which no one knows exactly how to describe it, but it's clearly uh, 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 in many ways been very successful. Uh, one of the important points I want uh, to make uh, is more general, though, than just talking about China. And that is that uh, at the end of the Cold War, uh, there was, uh, I think, a, a mistake made by many people in, in the West. Uh, Fukuyama wrote a very influential uh, book uh, called The End of History. And uh, the conclusion of that book was basically that the victory of Western, liberal Western democracies and economies over communism was uh, the end of the arc of history. Now everybody would be converging to this new economic model of liberal democracy. Well, uh, I think uh, there was a vast misinterpretation of, of the success. Uh, it was not our success, uh, but communism's failure that was really uh, at play. And there was a kind of complacency uh, in the years that followed uh, where we took uh, the fact that we were growing as evidence that our economies were successful. But GDP, as it's been mentioned, is not necessarily a good measure of success. GDP was going up, but say in the United States, most Americans were not participating in uh, this growth. To the point, for instance, to just give you a couple of statistics to, to, to see the na nature of the failure, uh, the median income of a full-time male worker in the United States and having a full-time job, those are the lucky ones, uh, is the same adjusted for inflation as it was 42 years ago. And at the bottom, real wages are the same as they were 60 years ago. So while we thought our economy was successful for very large fractions of our society, uh, it was not. In terms of health, the United States is one of the places where research is going on and making breakthroughs in medicine in all kinds of ways. But life expectancy in the United States is in decline. And that's particularly true of white males who are not college graduates. And one of the reasons is what uh, Angus Deaton and uh, Ann Case have described as deaths of despair. People committing suicide, drug overdose, alcoholism, uh, 
people giving up that life is not working. So as an American, uh, I, I feel very strongly that our variant of the market economy has been a failure. And the consequences of this failure of our version of the market economy is the rise of uh, Trump. And I, I, I'll be very frank, we are very afraid of this as a new form of fascism. Uh, and it has many of the symptoms of what happened in the 1930s. Of course, it's only 30% of the population that are diehard Trumpites. But just like fascism, there were only a small, you know, a minority of 30%, 35% that supported Hitler. It was the collaboration of the business community and other conservatives that led to Hitler's uh, rise. And the United States, it's the business community and other conservatives who have joined Trump in celebration of tax cuts for the rich, a tax bill that actually lead, will lead in a country with the highest level of inequality among all the advanced countries, will lead to a tax increase for a majority of those in the second, third, and fourth quintiles, in other words, for the vast majority, and which will result in a country where millions do have no health insurance, where the right to access to health care has not been recognized, it will result in more than 13 million people not having health insurance and our life expectancy continuing going down. So these issues of the nature of an economic organization are actually paramount. And they're paramount not only for our economy, but also for our society and for our uh, uh, democracy. Now, the story I'm going to tell of China is a story of the economics. And one of, the, uh, one of the hopes was that these economic advances by themselves would bring about more democratic reforms. And so far, there's been disappointment in that arena. So I don't want to pretend that this is all the success that we might have hoped. But I do want to, to describe to you in some ways the, uh, really the, the remarkable success and some of the lessons that their success has uh, for Western economies. So first one has to appreciate the magnitude uh, of that success. Uh, the, uh, it is in many ways uh, unprecedented. Uh, incre the I increasing GDP has been uh, over the period of 76 to today, a little over 40 years, uh, 40 years in which America's uh, incomes have stagnated, their GDP increased 40-fold, and income per capita increased 20-fold. Uh, today, it's the largest economy in uh, what's called PPP, purchasing power parity, which is a standard way of comparing countries because market basket prices uh, differ uh, dramatically. Uh, it's an interesting story, actually, about uh, the, uh, in 2015, it became the largest uh, country, uh, and uh, it was in part a result of the revisions of how we measure uh, uh, PPPs, the, the numbers that we use. And uh, when the independent body that does the PPP came up with these revisions, uh, they had to be accepted by the different governments around the world. And there were two countries that were very unhappy. Uh, the U.S. because it didn't want to become number two. Because <laughs> uh, we all know uh, we're number one. <laughs> and if the number said otherwise, something has to be wrong with the numbers. Uh, and the second thing was China did not want to be number one. <laughs> because they were afraid that they're sticking their head up, it was, uh, w they would be shot at, and they were absolutely right. Uh, so, um, but eventually, uh, they were persuaded, this is what the numbers say. Uh, uh, statistical offices have a kind of independence. I think it's really important that they have that. And uh, so that 
that's what the numbers say. Uh, it's the largest source of global savings. Not a surprise because their savings rate uh, is so much higher, say, than in the United States. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, personal savings in the United States uh, during the years before the Great uh, Recession fell to zero. Uh, we've been trying to increase our savings rate. China's been trying to decrease their savings rate. <laughs> Uh, neither of us has succeeded very well. Uh, it is the largest manufacturing economy, but perhaps the thing that one, uh, they should be most proud of is that while they had growth, they made sure that there was at least a modicum of sharing the benefits of that growth. 740 million people moved out of poverty. It is the largest success in anti-poverty ever in that kind of, in a 40 year span of time. Um, and they've made a successful transformation of their economy and their society in many dimensions uh, to what they call a social market economy with Chinese characteristics, education, innovation, uh, physical and soft infrastructure. But of course, there's still more, much to be done. Uh, the per capita income is somewhere between a fifth and sixth of the United States. Uh, there are many areas of institutional development, uh, uh, many aspects of the rule of law, for instance, that are, are deficient. Uh, there are many aspects of the quality of life. Uh, you know, many of my students do not want, uh, Chinese students don't want to go back because they don't want to die from pollution. Uh, that uh, it really is bad, although India now has taken over uh, the rank of being the worst polluted uh, place, but, but uh, uh, I say it is really uh, terrible. Um, and it's become a political problem. Uh, there was one vivid moment at the end of uh, w one of the party congresses where uh, the uh, premier was being criticized for not having fulfilled what they had promised to do in the environment. And he said, you know, I have to breathe the air too. And what he wanted to make clear is that he, he knew how bad it was because he lived there and he was suffering and he was trying to do as much as he could. Um, and uh, interestingly, uh, they are, uh, I was at a meeting where they were talking to uh, uh, the American auto uh, industry and they so told them, uh, if you aren't all electric, within the next four years, you're out of the country. <laughs> so uh, whether they will actually execute it, but he's making a very clear, you know, that they, it is a matter in many ways of life or death uh, because the air is uh, unbreathable. Um, there are uh, high levels of, uh, uh, there are lots of problems in the health system uh, their trends are positive, but they're still uh, very deficient. Uh, they have lots of problems of inequality, including access to education, especially for migrants. And when you use the word migrants, it's not from outside of China. It's from the rural sector to the urban sector. And when they come to the city, uh, if you don't have a, uh, what they call it, a hukou, a permit to come in the city, uh, the way they enforce it is your children don't get an education. It's a pretty cruel uh, system. Um, and uh, while they've done uh, more to move people out of poverty than uh, I said anywhere else, they've also created uh, the second largest number of billionaires outside the United States. So uh, at, at one form of inequality, they've, they've almost excelled, uh, uh, matched the level of the United States. Uh, and uh, there are some aspects of their economic policy that are worrisome, the excessive reliance on debt as part of their growth model, um, and uh, they have not yet developed a sustainable basis of finance for the local government. But the question I want to talk about mostly today is, how was China so successful? Uh, and at the beginning of that transition, uh, they had multiple problems. Uh, they had to uh, go from centralized control to a market system, 
They had to shift from a largely rural economy to an urban economy. They had to shift from agriculture to industry, and in some ways from a very poor developing country to a, an emerging market, uh, and to an innovation economy and a learning society. And when you think about this, these challenges, you can't help but think of the contrast with uh, a, a, a similar uh, challenge, uh, that of Russia moving to a market economy. Uh, Russia had a more educated population, much more educated, particularly in areas of science. Uh, it had more resources. Uh, uh, China was not, didn't have the kind of natural resources that, that Russia has, oil and uh, minerals. It was already more industrialized. It was more urbanized. It had a much higher GDP. Uh, yet, in the years after Russia began that transition after the fall of the Berlin Wall. Its GDP went down. Uh, its uh, living standards decreased by some 25-30%. And when we first were getting this data about how bad GDP was going down when I was at the World Bank, we were uh, worried whether our data was right. I mean, it was too dramatic. And after all, the ideology had been so strong. Everybody said, going to a market economy is supposed to lead you to be wealthy. <laughs> and so the incomes were supposed to be going up. Uh, you know, in math, we always say, well, maybe they made a sign mistake. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, they were going down faster than anybody thought they would be going up. But interestingly, and this is, uh, relates to what I said a, a minute ago, when we started getting data on what was happening to life expectancy, we knew that things were really bad. Their life expectancy was going down. And in fact, when I started seeing the data for the US life expectancy going down, it reminded me of the Russian data. It was a, a, a sign that, of societal disillusion of society coming apart. And in the Soviet Union, it was literally coming apart. But in the United States, it isn't, it, 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 the political system isn't, well, it is, the political system is coming apart, but, but the, the, um, it is really, a, uh, I, I think one ought to take really seriously uh, uh, that, that those data on uh, declines in life expectancy. And what we also saw in Russia was a process of deindustrialization to the point today that Russia is, in its exports, is almost totally dependent on natural resources, as dependent as uh, a poor African country is on natural resources. So it's gone from this you know, powerful industrial economy to uh, a natural resource economy dependent on oil and gas and uh, uh, cyber warfare. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, uh, what are the ingredients to China's success? Uh, there are uh, three ideas I want to put forward. One is uh, a kind of pragmatism, uh, a very non-ideological. Uh, it began with the recognition that this transition that they were facing was a new problem. No one had solved it before. So there was no model that they could go towards. They could try to learn from the experiences of other countries, but as you extracted lessons from those other countries, it was clearly, one had to be very careful because the situation in China was totally different from what uh, those other stories were. Uh, were. So, uh, that was the key uh, uh, challenge they faced. They, 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 wanted, they, they worked very hard to learn the lessons, and they talked to people uh, from, all, from all over. I, 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 went to, uh, I first engaged with them in 1980. In 1981, they brought me over, and we talked, spent uh, several weeks together talking. Um, and they talked to other people like Ken Arrow. And, 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 uh, so they actually tried to learn from other people. They were very open, but they also were shaping their own destiny. Uh, part of that pragmatism was uh, what Jiang 
uh, what, what, what they called crossing the river by feeling the stones. Uh, that you, they knew that they couldn't just plunge ahead. They, they, they just had to feel their way uh, in a, a, a very difficult path. The second thing which was really markedly different from that of Russia was gradualism uh, in contrast to shock therapy. Uh, my colleague at uh, Columbia got, uh, pushed this idea, uh, Jeff Sachs, uh, shock therapy, Larry Summers put uh, shock therapy, and the idea was if you did things very rapidly, uh, you would come out, it would be a, bad, a big shock, but you would come out somehow cleansed of the 70 years of communism and a new person. Uh, it didn't work. Uh, it was a shock, but there was no therapy. And uh, the result, uh, I think, has been devastating, both for the economics and for the politics. Um, but while uh, one has to have gradualism, gradualism means greater than zero. And there were some places in, in the former Soviet Union where uh, the gradualism meant nothing happening, and they didn't change. So uh, one had to have some kind of a mixture of speediness, doing some things very rapidly, but other things gra gradually. And that required judgment. And that was where people like Sachs and Summers really failed. They didn't, they didn't think about what things you could do quickly and what things needed uh, longer transition times. And thirdly, they recognized that at each stage of development, one required new institutional arrangements, new policies. And that meant uh, the marked shift in policies in each decade of their development uh, within a context of continuity. Now, you, would have th you could have thought, you know, after they were very successful in the 80s, to say, okay, now we have the right model and try to the same model in the 90s that have worked in the 80s. That would be the natural inclination that all of us would do. And that's what our politicians would tell us to do. But they realized that in 10 years, in the 80s, they had really transformed the economy. And the economy that they were entering into in the early 90s was a different economy than they had in 1978. And what worked in 78 was not going to work in 1990. Uh, in, 19, uh, in 2000. And so uh, it was this uh, recognition that the fact that something worked in the past was not necessarily evidence that would work in the future because the circumstances uh, could have changed. Uh, there's one more thing I want to emphasize, and that's uh, in a way very relevant to some of the debates going on uh, today, and I'll explain why. And that is the recognition of the importance of learning. And that what separates developed and developing countries is as much a gap uh, in knowledge as a gap uh, in resources. Uh, that uh, they realized that, uh, as well, that there were huge gaps in knowledge within a country that could be even larger than gaps between countries. And that, you know, one of the things that business schools try to do is to make sure that everybody's at the frontier. Uh, the reality is most people are well below the frontier. And so closing the, that gap between the frontier uh, and where the average practices are is one of the big challenges and really what a lot of good management practices uh, are about. Um, the... Uh, that meant they had heavy investments in education. They sent uh, many students abroad. About more than 10% of our students in Colombia are Chinese. Uh, and that's true of uh, an awful lot of the other uh, uh, major American universities. Uh, they learned from others. Uh, they, at the very beginning, they said opening, being open to others was an essential part of their d development strategy. The openness uh, was critical. Part of that was engagement in trade, um, but it was also a matter of listening to the experiences uh, of others. Uh, the 
the reason why I say this is also very relevant today uh, for all countries is that um, if we think about why our standard of living in the West is higher than it was 250 years ago, why we are living, uh, say, average life expectancy of 80 years rather than 40 years, uh, it's not because we saved more, it's really because we learned more. It's all based on research. And that is what's transformed our society. And uh, in a way, uh, Adam Smith, when he wrote The Wealth of Nations, could not have fully appreciated this because it was before we went into a learning economy. He talked about a pin factory, commerce, and that's important. But in terms of transforming our societies and increasing our living standards, extending our longevity, uh, what has made the biggest difference is research and our learning, learning by doing, you know, it's big learning, big steps and little steps. Those are the things that uh, uh, are important. Uh, the reason why I, I, I uh, uh, dwell on this at this moment is uh, the United States uh, seems not to have learned this lesson. Um, for the first time in our tax bill, we actually imposed a tax on universities. And a majority of the Republican Party believes that universities are bad things. Um, so uh, you have this, uh, you know, the, w uh, the wealthiest country in the world, arguably, not recognizing what is the source of wealth and going about systematically trying to destroy the processes by which you uh, uh, increase the wealth of the country. So uh, I think it's, it's uh, uh, one of the things that one uh, uh, should really uh, bear in mind. Well. Uh, as I say, it's not just innovation, it's, it's about uh, transmitting ideas. Uh, rec what they were very successful is, uh, in doing was recognizing that what was learned in one part of the country had to be transmitted to the rest. So the beginning of their development strategy, they tried things in uh, the East Coast and Guangzhou and, and provinces along the East Coast. But then they recognized there was a big gap between the East Coast and the West Coast, and they de deliberately had strategies to close that gap. And they didn't fully succeed in closing the gap, but they made sure the gap didn't increase, uh, and uh, it, it, they succeeded in, in reducing it uh, to some extent. And so the successes in Eastern China have been replicated in much of the rest of the country. And finally, as they've moved into the uh, uh, 21st century, they become more and more a focus on becoming an innovation economy. And uh, those of you who've been watching uh, the, the trade war, uh, essentially what Trump has demanded is they give up that aspiration uh, to be, by 2025, a modern technology technological country. Uh, China won't do that, and therefore, I think there is a real risk globally of a significant trade war because uh, the demand, what, what the U.S. is demanding is unacceptable and should be unacceptable to China. Uh, I want to spend a, a few minutes talking about uh, some specific institutional innovations that contributed to China's success. Um, uh, I'm giving you a broad view, but actually, uh, success of the magnitude of China had uh, required uh, developing some institutional innovations, ways of organizing society, uh, organizing production, that were different from the way things were done before. And uh, there was a lot of innovation in that, in ways that were, in ways uh, that were not there had not really been experiments like this, and it required uh, judgment, but also, uh, I would say, some economic theory. But it was a very different, in, in each of the cases I'm gonna describe, the conventional wisdom in economics said these would not work. So the IMF, the World Bank, opposed almost all of these changes. 
because they said uh, these won't work. But they did work. So the first is what was called the individual responsibility system in agriculture. Before that, they had uh, produced things in communes where everybody uh, worked together. Um, and uh, they shifted that to indivi basically individual farms. Um, and that provided strong incentives, as economists have predicted. But what they didn't do is give, it, give private property ownership to land. And you might say, well, that was essential, isn't it, for success? And the answer was no. Ownership of land, you could think of that was, you know, you want to make sure that you, the land is well managed, taken care of, and the community could make sure that that was done. But privatizing land would have opened up a hornet's nest of debates about uh, private property versus uh, public, uh, distribution of wealth, the good luck of having uh, a good fertile piece of land versus uh, an unfertile piece of land. It was just a huge hornet's nest. And what they said is we don't have to address that issue. Let's go first and just make sure that people have the right incentives. And let's monitor and make sure that they are using the land well. So, and it worked. Uh, they got what I would say is maybe 95% of the benefits that they would have had going all the way to privatization without the huge distributive costs that would have come from full privatization. And uh, in fact, uh, one of the most contentious areas in China today is inequalities associated with land. And in one way, I would say that they pushed privatization too fast on land. And land is the one scarce resource in China. It's their natural resource, and it is the source of their, what might be called their natural resource curse. Um, and uh, as I say, what, what happened in, in, in China is in such marked uh, contrast with the countries uh, in the former Soviet Union uh, that were ideologically committed uh, to quick privatizations. So what happened in the Soviet Union, they privatized, or Moldova, and you know, uh, um, and what happened to agricultural production? It declined precipitously. And um, the institutional frameworks associated with production change were eroded, and poverty and inequality uh, increased. Uh, one of the hard hardest problems, and this is a little bit of a technical issue, uh, was, um, something that can only be appreciated from a historical perspective and, and having been through that debate, the price system that they had in 1976 was uh, a planning price system. They had a kind of a pri uh, planning framework and that, out of that came some prices. Those prices had nothing to do with market prices. So the question was, they knew they were the wrong prices. Uh, they knew that those prices were not reflecting real s scarcity as we would teach it in a standard economics course, course, the marginal value of a resource. But they didn't know how to go from here to there. <clears throat> and that was where in uh, some of the macroeconomists uh, in the United States and in Sweden uh, pushed Russia to go to shock therapy. They say, well, don't worry about that detail of how you make the transition. Just do it. <laughs> and that's where you had uh, uh, the, 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 the part of the breakdown uh, in Russia. And what they did is create what was called the dual price system. What they did is they said, we'll use the old prices for 80% of the production, and then that number was 70 60%. But on the margin, we'll let there be competitive prices. So what they did is they got the advantages at the margin of incentives without the distribution cost of a sudden change. So it was a brilliant solution. Uh, the idea of having two price systems was an anathema to people who like in the IMF, they just said, this is never going to work, uh, but it did. Um, and so that's where simple ideology, you know, 
uh, gave the wrong idea that they had tried to face the key issues of how do you combine concerns about distribution with concerns about incentives, and they came up with this uh, solution. Um, a uh, third institutional innovation was the TVEs, the Township and Village uh, Enterprises. Uh, we had a big debate uh, at the beginning, uh, when I say we, we part of a, the discussion we had in 80, 81, uh, in the beginning of the Chinese transition, wa and then it came up again in the beginning of the Russian transition, uh, what was more important uh, in a market economy, uh, incentives or property rights? In the standard course in economics, you talk about both incentives, prices, and property rights. And so you say, well, why don't you do both? Well, you can't do everything at one time institutionally. So that raised the question, if you had to choose, what was more important? And basically, the advisors to Russia said property rights. And uh, Ken Arrow and I said competition and incentives were more important. So in the case of, of Russia, what happened was you didn't, you, you, they thought they were giving private property. They had voucher privatizations. They had all kinds of privatizations. But really, what they did is have property theft. And uh, the value of the state wealth, you know, trillions of dollars, went into the pocket of maybe 10, 20 oligarchs. It was the largest theft in the history of mankind. Uh, and uh, the level of corruption uh, embraced even American academics. Um, there's a very nice book that just came out a couple of weeks ago. Uh, called uh, Because They Could, that describes the, uh, the role of one of uh, Harvard's uh, economics professor who was the advisor to uh, Russia and something called the Rule of Law Project under the USAID. Uh, it's an amazing story, and some of you should uh, might enjoy reading it. Uh, it's an amazing story because uh, as they were teaching about the Rule of Law, uh, they had their accounts in Cayman Islands, and they were using inside information to uh, uh, make money off of the, uh, the Russian people and the Russian uh, uh, government massively. Well known in Russia, and uh, beginning to be, and and uh, they were convicted. This particular individual was convicted of conflict of interest, and Harvard took the strong action of depriving him of the name of his chair. <laughs> uh, so, uh, 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 there, uh, there, there was, in this uh, privatization process, uh, huge, what I call privatization corruption. Competition, I don't want to say the other system was free from corruption, but competition, decentralized competition, actually led to a race to create a market, an industrial economy. And um, uh, the TVEs were these uh, little enterprises in each little community, and, and the communities had existed before. So you used the social capital that was already existing. You didn't destroy everything. You used the social capital, but you converted it to create an industrial economy. And, um, and it worked. Um, the, um, one of the big differences uh, between the Russian and the China model was the theory of reform. Uh, the idea that uh, the uh, people like Schleifer and Summers had was that if you gave people private property, they would then have the incentive to create a well-functioning market economy. Uh, they made two mistakes. First of all, they forgot that part of the rules that they gave Russia, demanded, IMF demanded this, was that they have open capital markets. So as the Russians were stealing musha, money from uh, the government, they were taking that money out of Russia and using the rule of law in the UK and the United States to protect their wealth. And 
didn't want a rule of law in Russia because they wanted to continue to be able to steal inside of Russia. So it was an optimal framework. You stole within Russia because there was no good rule of law, and you could protect the property by taking it out of the country and use the rule of law in the West. Uh, it was an ideal uh, arrangement that the IMF had organized for theft. Uh, the, uh, and in a way, uh, you shouldn't have expected uh, Rockefeller or Gates to be the enthusiast of uh, strong competition policies. Uh, and that's what they wanted. You know, or you wouldn't want somebody who uh, is uh, engaged in corporate theft to be the advocate of corporate governance. So uh, I think they had uh, uh, t totally the wrong uh, theory. Well, as I said, the Washington consensus uh, policies said that TVEs wouldn't work because they had ambiguous property rights, they were still government, they were operated by the to township and the villages. And they said, well, public sector can't work. But it did. Um, and I think, as I said, partly by using the existing institutional infrastructure, developing new institutions and through competition, but also because it was at the local scale, there was a kind of monitoring that was going on that you couldn't have done at, at, at the national scale, but at the local scale, you could do that uh, monitoring. But on the other hand, the TVEs uh, have a, a scale limitation, so when they went into the next phase of the development in the last 15 years, the TVEs have played a much less uh, important role. Uh, throughout this development, uh, one of the important instruments of uh, economic policy has been industrial policies, uh, identifying priority sectors, but not exclusive focus on them. Uh, they use the exchange rate to promote uh, exports. Uh, uh, some people call that exchange rate management. Uh, the U.S. calls it exchange rate manipulation. Uh, it's actually the same thing. Uh, it depends on whether you're doing it or some other country is doing it. Um, but in some ways, I, one has to uh, recognize that China may have been lucky. Uh, they began their development strategy just at the moment when the West was very open uh, to importing manufacturing goods. Um, it uh, was a moment where, uh, because uh, there were large profit opportunities uh, in the West that sustained the opening uh, with, without regard to the effects on workers over the, uh, on the, over the, on, uh, uh, in, uh, the effects on the overall economy. So in a way, China's success is testimony to the failures of democratic politics in the United States and Western Europe. Because the rules of the game were designed, worked, to advantage American corporations, Western European corporations, with no uh, attention paid to the consequences to the workers as the United States deindustrialized. Now, some countries in Europe did pay attention and they did have active labor market policies that shifted workers from the old sectors that were dying into the new sectors. And um, Scandinavia has been very good in these active labor market policies, which I think are really important. In the United States, we didn't do that. Um, even though economic theory said opening up of trade between an advanced country like the United States and China, a less advanced, would result in lower real incomes for unskilled workers. This is the samuelson stoper theorem. And it was unambiguously clear, even though we were getting cheaper goods, real incomes of unskilled workers would go down. And it's only if you had a mystical belief in trickle-down economics would you think otherwise. But our politicians did have a mystical belief in trickle-down economics. <laughs>
And they asserted this over and over again. And so even when, you know, in the Democratic Party, we tried to get trade adjustment assistance, we tried to have some active labor market policies, when we couldn't because of concerns about austerity, not enough budget uh, concerns that they wouldn't work, uh, we went ahead anyway. There is a growing sense in the United States, though, that actually the agenda on the right was to increase unemployment and suffering. You say, why would they anybody, you know, wh wh why do people want suffering? Well, it was part of a concerted agenda, if you look at, to weaken the bargaining power of workers and drive down the wages, which increases profits. So if you look at this from a concerted point of view, the reforms in our labor laws, reforms in the way antitrust policy was enforced, that reform is a, not the right word, but changes in those laws, um, changes in corporate governance and implicit understandings, the legal frameworks, um, and uh, in the investment agreements and the trade agreements, the investment agreements, they gave more secure property rights if American firms invested abroad than if they invested at home, which meant that they were encouraged to invest abroad, which also meant that if, a firm, if workers came to a firm and said, we want higher wages, and the firm said, no, if you, we give you, if you continue to demand higher wages, we're going to leave, that was more credible. So I think it was a deliberate strategy to drive down the wages of workers. And it worked in terms of the economics that I described before. It did drive down the wages. But it has now led to these, this political backlash with which we are dealing. So there is a relationship between China's success and some of the problems uh, that we're facing. It wasn't inevitable. We could have managed it better. We should have managed it better, but we didn't. But just as a footnote, uh, the point I'm making is that that was a particular moment of time so Africa won't be able to follow the manufacturing export-led growth model um, that uh, led to the success of East Asian countries, including China. In fact, now uh, uh, globally, uh, manufacturing employment is in decline. And any country that uh, believes that manufacturing should be at the center of their economic policy is misguided. Uh, it can be part of it, but it can't be at the center. Well, uh, let me just conclude by some. Um, uh, let me just conclude by a, a set of remarks about uh, that, are in in a way that pertain to all countries, but where where China uh, realized this in a way more forcefully than many others have. And that is that reform is a never-ending uh, process. Uh, that uh, uh, societies are always changing, technology is changing, and therefore the policies that uh, are going to make a society successful have to change in a corresponding way. Uh, for China, China is entering a new stage of development. Uh, it's facing critical problems of inequality, health, environment, livable cities. Markets won't solve those problems. In fact, many of those problems have been created by the fact that they had markets that were too unfettered, uh, too underregulated. They're going to have to regulate them better. Uh, there are further questions posed by changing globalization. Uh, uh, the recognition of the risk of uh, excessive financialization. Uh, the West, I believe, hasn't succeeded in adequately taming financial markets. Uh, as you know, this, is, uh, this week is the 10th anniversary of Lehman Brothers, and, and a lot of people are talking about, have we done enough? I think it's absolutely clear, uh, no. Uh, and... Uh, uh, What's particularly disturbing is uh, the Trump administration is trying to undo the inadequate things that we've uh, already done. 
I, I, can, I was at a, a dinner right before the inauguration uh, of uh, Trump where one of his chief economic advisors w was there. Uh, I don't normally associate with these people, let me make it clear. Uh, <laughs> But uh, uh, it was an embassy dinner, so I, I, I uh, uh, and I didn't know he was going to be there. Anyway, they, they <laughs> uh, um, and he was uh, talking about uh, uh, how he was going to deregulate the financial sector uh, within weeks after taking office. Um, and uh, the first thing that struck me is he clearly had no idea of our democratic processes. And, you know, he really thought, you know, Trump is the dictator, he gets to write, rewrite all the rules, no, no, none of these pro processes that we put in place as democratic checks against authoritarian leaders. No knowledge of that, it was just so clear. But the second point uh, I was gonna ask, but somebody asked it before I did, uh, quizzically, uh, didn't we have a crisis in 2008? <laughs> And uh, the, uh, the implicit answer was, that was ancient history. Uh, and uh, we have to move on. Uh, but it's not ancient history. And I think the risks are uh, very much with us. Uh, one of the concerns that i have uh, increasingly uh, seeing in China is uh, that uh, as China grows, uh, the influence of vested interest uh, will grow. And you can feel it uh, already. Um, another, uh, just a little anecdote, every year uh, uh, when I go to China, I, I often uh, talk to the finance minister and I've been pushing them to move away from their debt finance growth model to more tax financed. In particular, I'm telling them they need a carbon tax. And uh, it would raise a lot of revenue. Uh, it would uh, help clean up their, their pollution. Uh, it seemed to me an obvious idea. And the finance minister every year says, great idea. <laughs> and uh, he says, w we have some political uh, problems, uh, which he means the auto industry, the coal industry, the st you know, steel industry, and so forth. Um, we're going to work on it next year we go through the same conversation. Uh, as China has grown, it, it has taken on many of the features of a uh, modern vested interest economy where uh, getting change is becoming uh, more difficult. And that, of course, is, is very worrisome. Um, but uh, the principles uh, that guided China in the first 40 years are likely to continue to be relevant. And that, by that I mean the pragmatism, crossing the river by feeling the sto stone, there are gonna be new problems, not fully foreseen, with that will appear. Um, it will have to address these problems using insights from theory and past experience. And the second critical point is openness. Uh, there is much to be learned from the experiences of others and from the insights of non ideological economic analysis. Um, uh, and again, uh, we're in a particular moment where, uh, I hate to keep coming back to the United States, but we're a little bit obsessed uh, with, with our problems. Uh, <laughs> um, one can't help but reflect on the closed-mindedness of our current administration, of not looking around. You know, if you think you're number one and you think that you're the, there's nothing to learn from anybody else, uh, that is uh, part of the beginning of the end. Uh, so uh, we hope that this is just a temporary interlude. <laughs> um, but uh, as we reflect on uh, what made China successful in the ways that it is. I think there are a lot of lessons for all of us to think about how we can make our own economy successful for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much.